Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Hebrew. We are on week five. Uh, the notes for this class you can find at theregathering.com slash page slash PFT Hebrew 3. All right. Well, last class we talked about the conjugation of the past tense. So we conjugated the past tense verb in the first person, second person, and third person, masculine and feminine, singular and plural. And this week, uh, referring to the same notes, Okay, so those are the notes from week four. There's a sheet in there that has the conjugation of the past tense directly below. The conjugation of the past tense is a chart of the conjugation of the future tense. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, the future tense is also referred to as the imperfect tense. Uh, it's referred to primarily that way in studies of ancient Hebrew. All right, you'll remember the past tense was referred to as the perfect tense. So past and future, or perfect and imperfect. Perfect represents an action that is complete, and imperfect means that the action in question is not yet complete. All right, so it doesn't mean exclusively future, but it can mean something that's in the process of happening and just is not finished yet. All right, in modern Hebrew, they simply call it past and future and use the verbs in that sense, but in ancient Hebrew, there's a little more... Um, a little bit more you can do with this tense than just strictly something that happened before and something that's going to happen later. Um, the idea of a process is inherent in this. But that aside, I'm going to use future and imperfect interchangeably, just like I'm going to use past and perfect interchangeably. I'll prefer past and future so that you don't think I'm saying imperfect when I mean perfect. Okay, so I'm going to call this the future tense, but just be aware that that's technically not this is. Uh, and also, the Hebrew term for future is atid, and so you will see this in Hebrew conjugation charts a lot of times to represent the future. Okay, now the root we used last time was shin mem resh, which means to keep, and so we will use that for the future tense as well as the past. And I won't um, belabor the point on this, but I am going to use the pronouns again just so you see them and make some notes as to um, some of these patterns because the future is a little different than the past. The first difference you'll notice between the future tense and the past tense is that in the third person, in the past tense, there is one verb that covers the plural of both masculine and feminine. Okay, so this line was absent from the future tense, or from rather the past tense conjugation chart, and it is present here. Okay, so in the future tense, there is a differentiation between uh, masculine and feminine in the third person plural. All right, so that's the first difference. And the future tense relies uh, primarily on prefixes to differentiate between uh, different uh, verb conjugations. There are some suffixes. But the past tense relies on suffixes. The future tense relies primarily on prefixes. All right. So, shamar means to guard. The future tense of to guard would mean will guard. Okay. So, ani, I, I will guard would be ani and apply the first person singular conjugation. So we use our olive prefix, as indicated on the chart. Ani, esh mor, esh mor. That means I will guard, or I will keep. To make this a complete sentence, we would need to say something like, Ani eshmor et ha mitzvot. I will keep the commandments. Or ani eshmor um, uh, et ha bayat. I will guard the house. Uh, again, shamar, to guard or to keep. Little different spin on things than just to obey. But that is a theological topic. So, ani eshmor, anachnu, that's we. We will keep would be anachnu. 
Nishmore. Nishmore. Okay, again, just plugging in the root letters to the paradigm. Nachnu Nishmor. Second person, masculine singular, so Ata. Right? Ata Tishmor. Right? Ata Tishmor. At, you feminine singular. Tishmeri. Tishmeri is how we would pronounce that. She, or not she, but you feminine singular will keep. And Ata Tishmor is you masculine singular will keep. Okay. Atem Tishmeru. Aten. Tishmor na. Right? So you will keep a group of men. Tishmaru. Atem Tishmaru. Aten. Group of women. Tishmor na. You will keep. Um, another difference worth uh, noting here is this chart gives the biblical Hebrew conjugation for the future tense. There is, um, modern Hebrew has in fact revised this, and the revision has taken place in the second person feminine plural. Okay? In modern Hebrew, there is not this uh, tishmor na form. Okay? Um, instead, they just use the masculine, the second person masculine plural, for both masculine and feminine. Okay? So in modern Hebrew, you would say atem tishmeru, and you would also say aten tishmeru. You would just use the same pattern for both. So you may look up a Hebrew conjugation chart online and find a difference, but this is the biblical form, the ancient form, and the modern form has just been revised to eliminate this, um, this separate form here and just um, basically use the same, the same form for masculine plural and feminine plural. Okay? All right, on to the third person. So who, which is he, third person masculine singular. Who, Yishmor, he will keep. He, which is she. Tishmor, she will keep. He, Tishmor. Another thing to point out is that the third person feminine singular looks identical to the second person masculine Singular. Okay? So, ata tishmor and also he tishmor. Now, this is usually not confusing because in context, this verb will have a subject and that subject will either be feminine or it will be ata, which is you. Alright, but it is worth noting that the same spelling and vowels are used for the second person masculine singular and the third person feminine singular in the future tense. Okay? Third person masculine plural, right? They, which would be haim, haim yishmeru, they will keep, and hain, okay, they feminine, Tishmor na, they will keep. Again, this pattern, the third person feminine plural, is the same as the second person feminine plural. And um, the way to distinguish between them is that if it's in the third person, this verb will have a subject, it will have a feminine plural subject. And if it's in the second person, it will not have a subject, or if it does have a subject, that subject will be Aten, okay, the pronoun you in the feminine and plural. Okay, and also modern Hebrew again has done away with this ending, 
So for the third person plural, they use what Biblical Hebrew calls the masculine plural form for the masculine and the feminine. Okay? So they would say Haim Yishmaru and also Hain Yishmaru in modern Hebrew. They've done away with this na ending. But we are teaching uh, Biblical Hebrew for the purposes of eventually Biblical translation. So I am using the Biblical forms. It's worth noting, too, that there are not, um, to my knowledge, that many significant differences in verb conjugation between ancient and modern, but there are some, and so I'm pointing those out as we move along. Okay, so that is the conjugation of the future tense. So, we've got, um, we've got all that for our Gizrat Shlamim. I want to cover a couple other Gizrot today. Show how those function and contrast them with the Gizrat Shlamim that we have just learned. Now, switch out my marker. This one's running dry. There we go. So if you refer to the conjugation chart from week five, you will note that I have Gizrat Lamed Aleph listed there. Now, I'm not going to go through every single permutation of the Lamed Aleph conjugation, but I want to point out what the significant differences are. Um, first of all, Lamed Aleph you will not uh, necessarily find in all verb conjugation charts. Um, this is because Lamed Aleph technically belongs to Gizrat Shlamim. It belongs to Gizrat Shlamim because in any Lamed Aleph verb, uh, none of the radicals will ever disappear. Okay, there are other conjugations in which radicals do disappear, such as the Lamed He, as we will see in uh, once we're done with Lamed Aleph. But technically, Lamed Aleph is not really its own Gizra. The reason that I include it separately is because there are, there is a subtle difference between Lamed Aleph conjugation and normal conjugation, and so I want to point that out just so you're familiar with it, and so when you come across these. Um, these verbs that have an aleph as their third radical, you don't wonder why there's these mysterious vowel changes that seem to be coming out of nowhere. So I want to address those vowel changes briefly. The main vowel change in the past tense, uh, you'll notice that in the third person, masculine, singular, and again, this is the past tense, I've got listed first radical, second radical, and Aleph is our third radical. And in, se in, the, um, in the normal conjugation, okay, and what I'm calling the Shlamim, the paradigm is a Kometz under the first radical and a Patach under the second. But in Lamed Aleph, the third person masculine singular has Kometz, Kometz. And all, if you compare the two charts, the Lamed Aleph chart to the, uh, the chart that I've labeled Shlamim, you'll notice that anywhere that uh, a Patach would precede the Aleph, it's changed to a Kometz. Okay, that vowel is lengthened. Now, technically, there's a rule that uh, tells you that's going to happen. So if you know all of the, all of the intricacies about... Um, syllables and how vowels change in regard to them and the corresponding letters, then you would know this automatically. Okay, But I have not taught those things, and um, so I want to point, I, I need to point it out for your sake that um, that is the major difference. The major difference in, uh, in, in the past tense.
and in the future tense, Okay, the normal paradigm, again going to the third person, masculine, singular. Okay, the normal paradigm, or the Schlamming paradigm, is this pattern. Okay, so yish more, say. But with Lamed Aleph, pattern is the same until the last vowel. Instead of using a cholam, a comets is used. Okay, so given a root kuf, resh, aleph, right, which means to call or to read, right, we would say yikra, Kuf is our first radical, Reish is our second, and Aleph is our third. Okay, we would say Yikra and not Yikro. Okay, because the Lamed Aleph uses a different vowel in front of the Aleph. Alright, and so you'll notice in the future tense that anywhere a Cholam would be used in front of the Aleph, it instead changes to a Kometz. Um, now, as I say, it's difficult to find a chart that, um, that uses Lamed Aleph separately. So uh, there's an asterisk at the bottom of your sheet corresponding to the second person and third person feminine plural conjugations in the Lamed Aleph future tense. And um, I've included that asterisk because... Uh, having been unable to find a chart that includes the Lamed Aleph separately, uh, I was not able to 100% uh, uh, verify that the forms I have written down are in fact the correct biblical forms. They're my best guess that follows the pattern that the rest of it follows. Um, the second and third person feminine plural forms are the least common forms you will encounter because anytime there is a mixed group it defaults to the masculine plural form. Okay, so it's very rare that you have a group of only women okay, that are doing a particular thing um, in a biblical narrative. And um, so uh, those forms don't occur very often. Uh, so you, I mean, they may not, it's possible they don't occur at all with the Lamed Aleph uh, verb, although I suspect that they probably do somewhere. Um, but I wasn't able to track that down, and so that represents my best guess. I just want, want it to be clear that that is not an authoritative uh, statement on that. But the rest of the chart I am 100% uh, confident in, and so it does represent an accurate uh, conjugation of the Lamed Aleph, uh, kind of half Gizra. All right, but I do want you to be aware of that, that vowel change, all right, that before that Aleph, uh, the vowel will frequently change to a Comets. And otherwise, the conjugation is identical to what I've called the shlamim on the other page. Okay? So that is the Lamed Aleph Gizra. All right, now I want to talk about the Lamed He, which is another sheet from week five. Lamed Hay Gizra is any verb whose third radical is Hay. One I will use is Beit Nun Hay, which means to build. And uh, you'll notice on that conjugation sheet, third person, masculine, singular. has nothing uh, particularly unusual about it. Okay. Bana, who bana, okay, would mean he built. Okay. So comets, comets is our pattern. If you look at the feminine, third person feminine singular, 
you'll notice an infix. Okay, a tav appears in the middle. So hu bana he banta. Okay, she built would be he banta. And again, third person plural is shared by masculine and feminine. And And in Lamed He, the He disappears. So Lamed He is not included in Binyan Shlamim, or I'm sorry, in Gizrat Shlamim, all right, because the third radical, okay, the, the last letter in the root, disappears from this verb conjugation. All right, so if you see Banu, and you're trying to trace back what root word this comes from, you've only got two of the original letters left in the word. All right, and this makes it a challenge sometimes to identify the roots of words, and that's why these charts are essential for uh, tracing where, where these, uh, you know, the original definitions of these verbs. <clears throat> if you know the pattern, if you know, oh, hey, the lamed hey third person plural is to drop the hey and add the uh, vav with shuruk, then you can fill in the blanks and know that bait is the first radical, known as the second radical, and the third radical must have been a hey. All right, but you you have to know these patterns in order to um, in order to track that down. But again, in this gizra, that third radical in some cases will drop off. And in some cases, it will not only drop off, but will be replaced with something else. So in the first person, uh, first person singular, again, still in the past tense, the hey drops and it's replaced by a yod making baniti, ani baniti, I built. And first person plural, anachnu baninu, All right, we built. And you'll notice in the second person that that he is further replaced by uh, the chiric yod. Okay, whereas, uh, well, just to you can look at the charts yourself, but just to illustrate the contrast. Okay, the lamed he. and the shlamim. Okay, they are very similar. All right, they use the same suffix, but in the lamed he, the third radical is replaced by a yod. Okay, drops off and uh, and is replaced. Okay, so there are these differences between all the giz wrote. So that's why I encourage you to memorize the shlamim, memorize the pa'al shlamim, because then you can contrast that with the other giz wrote, and it forms a, you know, a way for you to distinguish between them and to also to recognize the roots. Okay, so if you ever see baniti or any two letters followed by et, okay, cherik yod tav cherik yod. You can be pretty confident that that is representing first person <coughs> singular past tense of a lamed he verb. All right, and as I say, there are many of these gizrot to remember, but as you look over them and use them, you'll become more and more familiar with those patterns, and it'll make it a lot easier to read the language. 
All right, so that's the Lamed Aleph, past and future. Ah, yes, the Lamed He, future tense. So going back to the third person, masculine, singular. We see that it is identical to the shlamim, except for a vowel change. And actually, um, I need to double check something real quickly. I will be right back. Okay. This, by the way, is, um, I'm not, this is not a plug for this, but this is just an example of a Hebrew textbook. And you can see that their conjugation charts, you probably can't see this real well, their conjugation charts are laid out entirely in Hebrew, okay, which is why I'm giving some of the Hebrew terms like avar and atid. Um, and also it doesn't have the, the kind of neat boxed off form that mine does. Again, you probably can't see this real well, but it it doesn't subdivide things the way mine does. So you can't just take this and line up third person, masculine, singular, and so on. Um, so I like the way that my charts are constructed because it does make it easier. But uh, just be aware that most charts may not be constructed in that way if you find them in a dictionary or a textbook. So it's good to know how to navigate your way around. I also encourage you to make your own charts as we uh, come across these things. Of course, the already existing ones are available for your use online. But if you write it down, it does aid in memory. And it also helps you, uh, you know, if you have to solve problems with, uh, with the information, it helps to retain it. So I encourage you to do that, but um, of course the charts are there for your convenience. And uh, I find them easier to use the way I have them laid out than the way I've seen them laid out in a lot of other places. Although the way I lay them out is uh, not conducive to saving paper. Okay, it uh, takes up a lot more space. Um, so that's probably why it's not done that way most of the time. But anyway, uh, that aside, uh, we see that this is identical, again, to the, uh, to the shlamim, except for this vowel here. And indeed, in the future tense, um, the hey does not disappear from the, uh, from the conjugation, except in places where a suffix is added. So, in the second person feminine singular, okay, we find once again that the hay has been replaced by a yod. Okay, but otherwise, except for the, the cases where suffixes are used, you'll notice in the lam and hay that the hay remains intact through most of the future tense. However, it does disappear in quite a bit of the past tense. And just going back to the present tense, if you'll recall, if we were to say he is building, say who bonet. Okay. 
hubone, he is building. Hibona, okay, heim bonim, and hain bonot. All right, so that's the active participle or the present tense. Okay, so as we learn more tenses, because now we've covered the present, the past, and the future, there are in fact more tenses. Those will be covered at a later date. Um, but as we learn those, you'll you'll find those charts all kind of going together, uh, listing different tenses, so it will make an easy reference source um, for various uh, Binyanim and Gizrot. So that is the Lamed Aleph and Lamed He, and also the Shlamim, future tense. So uh, just a few examples to kind of show it in a complete sentence to uh, put it into practice. If I were to say, David kept the commandments, Okay, how would I construct a sentence like that? All right. The easiest way is to start with your subject. Subject is David, David. All right. David is masculine and singular. Kept is past tense, okay, in the past. Completed action. He kept the commandments. So we also, okay, so we know we need masculine and singular. Which person do we need? Well, we're talking about David, not to him, and we're not David ourselves in, in this sentence. So we're talking about him, so he's third person. Okay, the root for to keep is shin, mem, resh. So Using our conjugation chart, we find the past tense, third person, masculine, singular, and plug in the appropriate vowels to the root letters. And we find that to be shamar. So David shamar, David kept, and now he kept the commandments. Okay, well, David's the subject. He's the one doing the keeping. The things being kept are the commandments, so they are the object. So, as the direct object, they must be preceded by et, right, to indicate that the direct object comes next. Otherwise, we don't know if David's keeping the commandments or the commandments are keeping David. Although, in the case of this sentence, we actually would. Why would we? Because if it was the commandments that were the subject, Okay, since commandments is plural, we would need a plural verb. All right, so that's a hint. Uh, four times when you actually will find sentences that don't include an et, all right, a lot of times plurality or gender, you know, number, gender or number will give away what's the subject and what's the object. All right, it doesn't help, though, when your subject and object are both the same gender and both the same number. All right, that's why et is so very important. Okay, so David Shamar et. All right, mitzvah is a commandment. All right, so commandments is mitzvot. And we need the definite article to make the. Okay, so ha. Remember our rule way back when we talked about the definite article, that the first letter following it takes a dagesh. Okay, and for nouns ending in hey, the hey drops off before we add the plural suffix. So David shamar et ha mitzvot. David kept the commandments. All right. All right. How about um, Rachel? Rachel is our new subject, and we want to say, Rachel will build a house. 
Well, Rachel is feminine and singular, so we need a feminine singular verb to build Beit Nun He. Okay. Okay. Will build is in the future tense. It's an action that's going to happen. So, uh, in the future tense, we have to pay attention to person. Rachel is someone we're speaking of, so she's third person, feminine, and singular. So we need the third person, feminine, singular, future tense verb. Okay? To build is the verb we want, but we notice the third radical is a he, so it must be conjugated according to the rules of lamed he. Okay, of gizrat lamed he. Right? So, on the Lamed He sheet in the imperfect or future tense, we'll find the third person, feminine, singular. Plug in the letters of the root. We wind up with Tivne. Okay, Rachel Tivne. Rachel will build. What will she build? She'll build a house. House is the object. So we need an et. Before house, which is by it. So Rachel Tivne. Et by it. Normally you'd say et ha something, but in this case I'm just talking about a house in general, not a particular house. Rachel Tivne et by it. Rachel will build a house. All right. How about you, masculine plural, so I'm speaking to a group of men, atem. Uh, and I'm going to say, you will call me, okay? You will call me. All right, the root to call is kuf, resh, aleph. Okay, this is to call. You is plural, atem is plural, it's masculine, and it's in the second person. Okay, you is a second person pronoun. We also notice that this ends in an aleph, so we have to use the lamed aleph conjugation. So if we find the second person, uh, well, yes, the lamed aleph conjugation, you will call, so it's future tense. So in the Lamed Aleph, find the future tense, second person, masculine, plural, and then fix uh, the proper prefixes, suffixes, and vowels to the root. We come up with tikra'u. Atem tikra'u. You will call. All right. Who will they call? You will call me, is what I'm shooting for. So, me is the object, so we proceed it with et. And now our object, ani or anochi. Okay, atem tikra'u et ani. Okay, you will call me. Now there's actually a shorter way to say this. In fact, there are two shorter ways to say this. And we'll learn those um, in the coming weeks. There's a way to combine um, 
you know, a lot of Hebrew is, is combining words together, as we saw with the uh, prepositions and also with the pronominal suffixes. Um, and so there's, there are ways to combine other prepositions as well, including the um, sign of the accusative. There's a way to combine that with ani. There's also a way to combine both of those with the verb itself, but I'm not going to get into that for some time because that makes things um, just a little more complicated than we need to get right now. But this is, in fact, a sentence in action. This is verb conjugation in action. Okay, we see we're using um, differing between tense. We're using past tense, future tense, future tense. We're, we're uh, using different persons. Okay, third person, and this is also third person. And now we're using a second person verb down here. And we're matching the gender. Okay, so masculine, feminine, and then masculine again. And we're matching the number, singular, plural, and plural. All right, so you have to, you have to consider all of those parameters when you're constructing a sentence with a Hebrew verb. You have to consider the person, the gender, and the number of the subject, and you also have to think about is this past tense, present tense, future tense, or uh, as we'll learn, there are actually other tenses as well. Which tense um, do I wish to use? All right, so that is, the, that is how uh, verb conjugation functions. It's all about matching your verb to the subject in the sentence. All right, so uh, we will expand upon this further in future classes. Until then, shalom, and have fun in your studies.